with that in a minute. Please keep that passage open. Um, I'm going to be preaching from it. Okay, sorted. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence here with us. Thank you that when we gather together in your name, you promise to be here in the midst of us. And so thank you that you're here um, in this room. Thank you that you're with the children in different parts of this site. And because you're here, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be attentive to you. That you would speak to us and speak right into the very depths of our beings, into our hearts. And we pray that as a result of that, Lord, we would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today um, I'm going to be um, speaking about generosity and um, particularly about money. And so if this is the first time you've been here, um, I want to assure you that we only ever talk about money about twice a year. Um, and this is one of them. So you're, you've you struck gold today in terms of um, uh, what I'm talking about. So we don't always go, go on and on about money all the time, but today... Um, we're going to talk a little bit about money, but particularly in the, in the framework of generosity. Our vision as a church, and we are in a vision series, we are SPS, is um, to make disciples, to transform communities, and to plant churches. And we do that so that we might see Shadwell and East London transformed by the love and power of Jesus. That's what all this is about. That's what we are seeking to seek seeking to see and seeking to find as we go about what God has called us to do as a church here. And visions cost money. And so sometimes we have to talk about that. Sometimes um, we explain kind of what it's all about. And if this is a vision worth going for, it's worth um, financing as well. But this, there's, uh, that's set against a bigger backdrop of giving generally because Jesus wants us to get giving right particularly in something like a recession, when um, there's so much focus and, and, um, and uh, scrutiny on money and the way money is used. So I want to use this passage today to look at um, what, uh, how we use money, how we um, give money, and what, what it's all about. And the assumption all the way through the scriptures is that um, we should give money to the Lord um, by giving to the church. In the Old Testament, they had a tax. It was called the temple tax. They gave 10% of their income to the temple, and that went to the work of the priests and um, the upkeep of the, of the building and so on. In the New Testament, the um, emphasis was, is much more on the church, giving to the church, but so that it might give um, to, um, in its work and to the poor around um, the church as well. And so um, that's very much the context of uh, how giving to the Lord works in, in the scriptures. There's that kind of proportion that is given um, as a re on a regular basis. And then there are extras that kind of come in from time to time. Tax, actually, was interesting, was um, after that. So if the king wanted some tax, he would take his proportion as well. And we have a little bit of that in our country as well, which is exciting. Um, uh, but the question today is how? How um, does that all work? And I want to just look at six principles, and I'm going to attempt to draw them as well, um, so that it kind of just um, gets into the mind a little bit. So um, those six principles are going to be, uh, if I put generosity at the beginning here, try and spell it right, and I'm going to divide this sheet into six parts. One, two. And I hope that um, you'll be able to see this as we go through it. So the first principle that we see in this passage is what you reap. You know, what you sow, you reap. That principle, what you sow, you reap. So look at verse 6 of chapter 9, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Remember this, Paul writes, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So here are some seeds, and they're going into the ground, and here is the harvest. 
that happens when you um, when you sow generously. You get a fantastic thing. Does that look anything like a bundle of corn or hay or something like that? Yeah? You get the idea. So there we go. So that's the first picture. So remember that picture. What St. Paul is saying is that no one ever lost out when they were generous. Giving's like sowing seeds. You know, we've got um, grass in our garden. It's got lots of patches on it, have you seen it? And we've experienced, if you just put a little bit of grass seed down, it stays patchy. But if you chuck loads of grass seed on, actually the grass grows and the patches fill and it looks fantastic until our dog kind of tramples it again. But that's part of the kind of investment. When you sow generously, you get a harvest, which um, is like the reaping of that generosity. And it's exactly the same with giving, giving money, giving our time, giving our energy and skills. If you don't give very much, there's not a lot to say for it. So Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, a faith that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. Mother Teresa said, if you give what you do not need, it isn't giving. On the other hand, if you give a lot, then there's a lot to show for it. So um, J.L. Kraft, he's the head of Kraft Cheese Corporation. Um, He'd given approximately 25% of his huge income to Christian causes. And he said this, The only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. The first principle of giving is about giving generously. The more you sow, the more you reap. If you're generous, you will see great fruit from your giving whether it's into a person's life. We see that with children, don't we? The more you invest in your children, the more you, you gain from that. The more, you put, the more time you put into something, the more um, fruitful uh, that is. So whether it's a person or a ministry or a church um, on the receiving end, the more you put in, actually you can see the benefits of that. Their needs are met. But also you see sometimes that blessing bounce back to you. I'll speak more about that um, later on. And some people might say, well, can I afford it? How can I afford this? And Paul is saying to the Corinthians here that God will meet your needs. Look at verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So generosity has nothing to do with how much money you have but it's got everything to do with how much, um, of what you, how much of what you have are you prepared to give. So it's not the, the amount you have, but actually what you have and what you're prepared to give from that, which is where generosity starts. It's an English preacher called um, J.H. Jowett, who was um, around at the beginning of the last century. And he said, the real measure of our wealth is how much we'd be worth if we lost all our money. The first principle is what you sow, you reap. Second principle we see here is to give cheerfully. Look at verse 7. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, For God loves a cheerful giver. This is a very easy one to draw. God loves a cheerful giver. Even you could draw that, couldn't you? (laughs) Paul is saying, if you're going to give, don't be reluctant about it. Don't feel pressurized. But give from your heart cheerfully. Be cheerful about giving. We don't really hear that very much in our world today, do we, in our society? But give cheerfully. That's the encouragement from Paul here. Um, Henry Ford, as in Ford Motors, I love this story, was um, approached by a um, 
by a, 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 ho a local hospital, a fundraiser for a hospital, to give some money. And he said, I, I'll give you $5,000. And in the newspaper the next day, there was an article that, was, that ran, um, Henry Ford uh, donates $50,000 to a um, local hospital. And Henry Ford, who just promised 5000 was very angry with this. And he rang, rang up the fundraiser and said, look, I gave you 5000 not 50000 So what are you doing having this in the, in the newspaper? And the fundraiser said, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, I'll, I'll say to the newspaper, can you print a retraction? It'll go something like this. Um, Henry Ford reduces his giving by $45,000. And uh, Henry Ford thought, well, this is obviously not going to be very good publicity. And so um, he said, OK, you've got me over a barrel. Um, I, if I give $50,000, I want this to be written above the door of the hospital as you go into it. And it was these words. I came among you, and you took me in. The biblical inscription. <laughs> Why cheerfully? Why does Paul say God likes a cheerful giver? Well, God, we, we see, loves cheerfulness. You know, joy is part of the nature and character of God. That doesn't mean that um, there's no space for compassion and sadness and you know, the, 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 the difficulty, difficult things in our lives, and we just brush those, sweep those aside. No, it's not about that. But actually, it's connecting with a deep part of ourselves, which is part of the very nature of God. Remember, Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross. There's something about understanding the, the deep reality that God loves to give. And that, 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 that giving produces joy. The word here, I love this, the Greek word is hilarion. It's where we would get the word hilarious from. So Jesus, God, wants a hilarious giver. I mean, that is just completely different from, uh, you know, just, gosh, dipping into my wallet to, to feel very hilarious about this. Actually, God wants us to find that place in our hearts where we can give hilariously. God loves a cheerful giver. It's the attitude of gratitude. That's what we're tapping into. There was this um, missionary in Korea who um, was showing a visitor around. And as the visitor was kind of walking around with this missionary, um, they saw this father and son working in a paddy field with a plow, and they were pushing this plow by hand. And the visitor said to the missionary, gosh, those people um, must be very, very poor. And the missionary said, yes, they are. Um, they're from the Chi Nevi family. And um, they've got an amazing story because last year they wanted to give some money to the building of their church. But they didn't have any money to give. So they sold their ox and gave the money from the ox to the poor, uh, to the church. And that's why they are um, plowing this year um, by themselves without an ox. They're doing it by hand. And the visitor just paused um, and thought uh, for a, uh, a long while. And then he just said to the missionary, that is real sacrifice. And the missionary said this, they don't call it a sacrifice. They're just thankful they had an ox to sell. Second principle, God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful giving is that principle. The third principle we see here is the more you give, the more you receive to give. Look at verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So there are two ways we can view our money as Christians. One is to say, how much of my money shall I give to God? And the other way to see it is, how much of God's money shall I spend myself? Completely different way of seeing it. The reality um, is that everything belongs to God. 
everything comes from God. We've just prayed that before. And we, of the things that we receive from God, we give back to him. So this third principle, I'm going to draw like this. So here is a container of your resources. Everything you have. And this principle says that everything we have comes from God. Everything. And it's from those resources that we're then able to give to various things. We give our time. We give our money. We give our skills in different ways. But the more that we give, the more God replaces that with more that we can give. Everything belongs to God and everything flows through with God. So the, when we begin to realize this principle, we begin to realize how God's economy works. And this is an amazing principle. So first, that verse 10, look at verse 11. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So the more you give, it's like the Lord just replaces that with more that you can give. And more and more. And we have experienced that again and again. We've experienced that with church planting. So um, we have, um, in 2010, we planted two churches. We um, sent people away. We sent money away. We spent, uh, we, we've continued to invest in those churches. And they are thriving. Just in the last few weeks, we've planted our third church, St. Um, St. Luke's Millwall. We sent 20 fantastic adults, 15 fantastic children, money, resources, time, energy, and we're continuing to support them. And so that's costly. But what we found again and again is that God replaces what we've given with more. So just a few weeks ago, we gave those people away. That's why you know, we've, we've got less people. And we want to, we're going to see God bring more and more people to the church as a result. We've seen that ourselves in our own lives with financial giving. As we've given, God has always supplied all of our needs. We've received. And there's so many different things. Our, possession, our possessions, our home, just the way we use things. God gives us these things so that we can share them with others. And the more we do that, the more we receive to be able to do that. God gives us resources to use and invest for him. I think, you know, the, the way the seeds work is that, you know, it's interesting that how God's worked this, that you sow seeds and when they produce a harvest, part of that very harvest has got seeds in it to be able to sow again. And, and so on, the cycle goes on. It's the same with uh, money and time and skills. The more we give, the more those things will be given to us that we, so that we can keep on giving. They're not supposed to be kind of held close to us. So, wealth, if we have it, is to be given away. It's what it's for. It's um, to, uh, verse 11, you'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And he says that it's going to bounce back a little bit. Through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. It's going to make a difference. So, we've got what you sow, you reap. Second principle, cheerful giving. Third principle, the more you give, the more you receive to give. The fourth principle is a very simple one. To give, you've got to give. So to be generous, you have to actually give something. And the reason I've made this point is that it's easy to want to give. I want to give. But actually, it's not until I actually do it that the giving is complete. So um, I think this whole passage is about that. But um, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, writes this, verse 2. On the first day of every week... It's advice to that church. Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So he's encouraging something regular, something consistent, something that's been considered, something that is sowing generously, 
something that is uh, cheerfully given and with God's economy in mind, all these things. But it's, it's very much considered. Decide in your heart, Paul writes earlier, what to give. And so um, I'm, I'm going to draw a little chart here. Um, this is an expenditure chart. So this is the way we spend our money. And I think, you know, if you were to broadly look at it, there are three simple ways that we might give. The first one that we're talking about is um, giving to your church. And we need to decide in our hearts how much to give. Um, in the Old Testament, it very much talks about giving the first fruits. So as, we, um, as our income comes in, how much are we going to give back to the Lord? A second one might be, actually, what are we going to save? So um, if I do a little thing like this, do you know what that is? It's a little piggy. And here is a piggy bank. Okay, so how much are you going to save? Because actually, you know, we, it's a good thing to save. And then how much do we actually um, spend on ourselves? So we might, you know, we need clothes to wear. And we need food to eat. Uh, it's a little spoon there. And, you know, we need to work out that. And the difficulty is that if we take those things out, we end up spending everything. And if we're careful we might save something, I'm just putting it aside. Um, but actually, it's only when we consider what you're going to give, what you're going to save, what you're going to spend all together, that's when you really get this formula right. And that takes, you've got to take time to think about that. And it's very practical. It means you need to sit down with your accounts and to say, what is the income coming in? How much am I going to give? How much am I going to save? How much am I going to spend? What is the tax implications of this? I would encourage you, I think the scriptures teach about giving before tax. And the in interesting thing is that, um, you know, with tax, uh, with, the, with our tax regime, we can actually get money back from the tax man. So that, we, that is, a, you know, we can, we can uh, you know, pay um, gross, uh, you know, not including, you know, the tax is basically given back. So, what do we do? We start with our income and work through and work out how much we're going to give for each of these things. Um, the billionaire financer Rockefeller said this, I would never have been able to tithe, that's allocating a proportion of your income, in that, percent, in, in that case it's 10%, I would never have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50 a week. He started right at the beginning. The first time he had an income, he decided, I'm going to give a proportion of that um, away. So on a very practical note, um, two things to say about this. One is planning and the other is debt. First of all, planning. Work out, take some time even today, work out what you're going to give, save, spend. Um, you'll see in your seats a, a form like this. This is something we're encouraging everyone to do, which is to start an account with stewardship. Stewardship is designed to help us to give. It's to help us to give carefully, considerably, um, and um, to the places where we want it to go. And so this is not us, this is stewardship. This is a separate, independent organization. And they're a Christian organization, and they, they exist to help people to give. And actually, they're behind the 40 Acts of Generosity campaign during Lent. And on this... What we're encouraging people to do, if you have a standing order with the church already, w what we'd love you to do is to actually move that standing order to stewardship and then ask stewardship to give to us. And the reason for that is that it's actually going to save the church money because um, their, their costings are much, uh, uh, they, they can do it cheaper than we can. But also it enables you to be much um, uh, more directed about the way you give. And so on the back of the form, there's some, something about, there's a little bit about regular giving, who you'd like to regularly give to. And there's also a little section about one-off gifts, if you'd like to give a one-off gift to the church or to another body or something like that. And um, that enables, as well, uh, you to be able to get the tax back. And you can allocate the tax back either to the church or to accrue in a separate fund that you can spend as well. So um, please do take that away with you. And um, we'd encourage you to fill that in as soon as possible to help with that. And um, to pay, really, we'd love to encourage you to give 
some of that giving to the church. That's going to go towards the cost of ministry, to the cost of making disciples. It's going to go to the cost of um, the way we invest in transforming our communities here. It's going to go towards church planting. So we are still giving money to our church plants to help them as they get started. Um, All Hallows Bow, which is a, a, um, a church two or three miles over there, is in one of the poorest parts of this borough. And um, they are doing amazingly in terms of um, beginning to raise their own funding. But we're helping them as they get to that target so they can completely pay their way um, in the near future. So that's um, giving. Please do fill in that stewardship um, form and give to St. Paul's. We'd love that. But the second thing is about debt. If you're in debt, we don't want you to give financially. Please do not give. If you're in debt that is, un, is, is kind of spiraling out of control, that's, that's, that is not being managed um, well at the moment, please do not give. We'd much rather you got that sorted out. And we have a debt advice ministry here. Um, if you want advice from them, they can give you specific and practical help. But we do not um, want to, you know, you can't, you can't give out of what you haven't got, um, particularly if it's out of control. So we want to be absolutely clear about that. There's um, sometimes, you know, particularly in these kind of um, situations um, nationally, there are situations where things get out of hand very easily, and we need to kind of swallow our pride and ask for help, and that will make a huge difference. And it could be a help from a friend. If you don't have someone to go to, debt advice here, we can put you in touch with the people, um, the ministry that Jackie um, and a number of other people are involved in to help people out of debt. So the fourth, fourth principle is um, to give, give. You need to give. If you want to give, you need to give. Very simple. Fifth principle is giving multiplies blessings. Look at verse 12. This service, talking about giving, that you perform, is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So what we see here is that when people give, everyone gets blessed. It's like your giving multiplies blessings. So um, the way uh, I'm going to draw this is um, here's you giving cheerfully. And here is uh, your gift. Nicely wrapped up there. And um, here are the people that it is affecting because it's changing the lives of many people. So when we give, first of all, we see here that the people we're giving to, their needs are supplied. Verse 12, this service you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people. It's the first thing it's doing, supplying people's needs. But the second thing it's doing is that it, it is overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So actually, these people are also just so grateful for what they've received. They are starting to say, Lord, thank you for providing for us. Thank you that our needs be met. We want to praise and give thanks to you. So again, blessings being multiplied. Um, the principal reward for giving is not for us. We are giving like this. The principal reason for giving is so that others might be blessed. Um, and uh, that's an amazing thing. I just want to uh, read out a little bit of, um, well, a message that Chris Rogers, who's the, who's the uh, senior pastor of All Hallows Bow, the church we planted, he said these words um, just in a note to me yesterday. It's the partnership with St. Paul Shadwell that has brought life to All Hallows Bow and made the new life possible. If it wasn't for the generosity of finance, we wouldn't have baptized 13 adult new believers and 12 children in the last year and a half. We wouldn't have seen the church grow from seven to 110. We wouldn't have been able to lead eight alpha courses or grow six connect groups. But more than that, it's the prayer support and kingdom partnership that has kept us going when it's been tough. It's um, the, meet, the meeting weekly with the St. Paul's Shadwell staff team that has kept us going, cheering us on and encouraging us to keep dreaming bigger for All Hallows Bow. They've received blessing after blessing from this church, from you. 
and they are so grateful for that. Giving is um, a wonderful experience as well. It's not just the people who receive. I think one of the things that um, happens when we start giving is that we get excited about it. It changes us. And I think that the blessing returns to us. So um, just look at verse 13 and 14. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, yourselves, people will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. So as you give to other people and um, to the church, which will then um, pass that on in ministry and so on, those people will give thanks for your generosity, first of all. So you're going to, um, God is going to be praised because of you. And so that's a, a wonderful thing. And in their prayers, verse 14, in their prayers for you, so they'll start praying for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. So here is an unexpected reward for giving. Basically, he's saying your gifts are going to be received with gladness, but there's going to be this bond that will develop between the receiver and the giver their hearts will go out to you. And, to, and they'll start praying for you. So do you want people to pray for you? I do. The people who are on the receiving end, as like all hallows, they give thanks to God for you, and they pray for you. The answers to those prayers might be experienced in our life, but actually the encouragement from the Scriptures is that our treasures are being stored up in heaven. We shouldn't expect necessarily to see a, a, a response to our gift in this life, but we might do. But actually, that is being stored up in heaven for us. Here's what happens when we invest in this principle, and uh, you know it begins to start getting exciting for us. It, you know, it gives when when you begin to start seeing the effect on other churches, it gives us a buzz. That's why, in a way, it's one of the things we that motivates us to keep doing it. But, um, I had the story of this uh, man called David Dunn. David Dunn was on a bus, and um, he um, he noticed the bus driver because this bus driver was extraordinary. He was just so cheerful. He was just so nice to everyone who got on the bus. He was always giving, saying nice things about them, and he was nice to them as they got off the bus. In fact, he had never David Dunn had never seen a bus driver like this before. I'm trying to imagine this in London. I'm the number 100 myself. Um, haven't quite seen it yet, but maybe um, it might happen soon. But this man, um, he was about to get off, and David said to the bus driver, um, he, he said this, you know, you are the happiest bus driver I've ever seen, and I wonder what is the reason for your happiness? And the bus driver said this, well, to be honest, I read in the paper a few months ago about a man who died and left a lot of money to the bus driver um, who was nice to him. <laughs> and he said, so I, th I thought maybe I'd try it for myself. <laughs> and he said this, but now I've enjoyed myself so much being nice to people, I don't care whether anybody ever um, leaves me any money anymore. I just want to be nice to them. He discovered the joy of giving. What was bouncing back to him as he gave to others. He thought, actually, this is, I want to keep doing it because it's so good. Giving, principle five, giving multiplies blessings. And sixthly, and finally, give as God has given. Look at verse 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The greatest gift ever given is Jesus Christ. Someone, well, in the scriptures, the most famous verse, isn't it, is God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So when we think about the love of God and we think about what it cost him, this is the kind of love that God has for us.
for us. It's a sacrificial love. It's a giving love. Someone said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Giving is all about love. It's all about the one who has loved us and been so generous to us. And receiving that love, we're able to give that love away. Giving starts and ends with Jesus. He's given everything of himself to us. And he says, follow me. I love the story of Joseph Rank. He was born in the 19th century and he became a committed Christian um, in the Methodist church. And with 500 pounds, he started his own business. Um, he bought a flour mill and started a milling flour. And he ran it completely on his own without any help. Um, when he got married, he realized that his finances were not as good as they could have been, as, not as much as he hoped. Um, in fact, things were actually going downhill rapidly. And, um, but rather than sell uh, his, you know, what he had, he decided to um, uh, invest instead. So he rented another flour mill. And from that moment, things began to improve. And he began to, um, uh, you know, things began to take off, in fact, financially and um, in business terms. And in time, he became a multi, multi millionaire. In fact, Rank Films was one of his um, companies. And um, he ran one of the largest milling operations in the world. But when it came to money, he followed another Methodist, John Wesley's advice. And his advice was this that um, he said, get all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And he used to say that money was always harder to give than to make. And so he took personal responsibility for finding out where every um, bit of the money that he gave um, went, how it was spent wisely, and um, that it went towards good things. And Joseph Frank, whose family empire was just huge, the, all the different rank films, rank um, uh, companies and so on that he owned, um, you know, they were just an enormous stretch of uh, portfolio companies. And he, um, but yet he himself lived frugally. Um, he was very generous to others throughout his life. When he died in the 1940s, the obituary columns and so on um, ran stories about him, and they reckoned that he was one of the richest people um, in the UK. Um, and so it was a great shock for them to discover when his will was read that he had just £70,000 to his name. He'd given the rest away. Let's stand.